Hey everybody and welcome to the 5 Bytes Podcast. I'm your host, Rory Monahan. The podcast, as always, is brought to you by my sponsors, Goliath Technologies, who help IT pros be proactive and anticipate, troubleshoot, and prevent end-user experience issues regardless of where IT workloads or users are located. And also by Liquidware, creators of FlexApp, the most feature-rich application learning product on the market. And, last but not least, brought to you by PolicyPack Software, where you use Group Policy or MDM to remove admin rights, manage and lock down applications, Java, browsers, mitigate ransomware, and more. If you enjoy the podcast each week, you have them to thank. Now let's get into some news. Earlier this week, people on Twitter started to report service disruptions within Slack. But, unfortunately, that pales in comparison to the drama that was about to unfold with the company's stock. You see, this week there was a report by Business Insider stating that, quote, Slack just scored its biggest customer deal ever as IBM moves all 350,000 of its employees to the chat app, end quote. So obviously, that sounds like it's excellent news. And as you might expect... That news sent Slack stock price soaring with a quick increase of over 15%. Then, abruptly, Slack's trading was halted while everyone was questioning what was going on, what caused them to halt the stock trading. It would later be revealed that the article wasn't exactly accurate. IBM was not a new Slack customer. In fact, they have used Slack for several years, And while they have expanded their use of the product, it's not in use by 350,000 of their employees. So after a correction, when the stock was allowed to trade again, very quickly it lost half of its gains that it made. So pretty crazy week for Slack. The February Windows patches have arrived, and the most interesting of the patches comes in the shape of a fix for the Internet Explorer Zero Day vulnerability that I talked about at length on an episode of this podcast about four weeks ago. Usually I give Microsoft a lot of credit for the fact that serious vulnerabilities in Zero Days tend to get out-of-band patches if they're pretty high severity within maybe 48 to 72 hours, but in this case... The vulnerability was disclosed shortly after the last Patch Tuesday, and they waited until this Patch Tuesday to fix it. Now, there was known workarounds to obfuscate things by manipulating the DLL in question. According to a ZDNet report, on top of the IE Zero Day patch, there are 98 other patches, of which 11 bugs have received a grading of critical, which is obviously the highest available. Most of the critical bugs are remote code execution and memory corruption bugs in services such as the IE scripting engine, the RDP service, LNK files, and the Media Foundation component. Other than that, there's nothing really out of the ordinary to highlight according to ZDNet. Interestingly, I just installed this month's patches myself, and there were over 600 megabytes in size, and it took some time to install, so it's a pretty big month for patches. Keep up on the podcast over the next couple of weeks and I'll cover stories of any reported issues from these patches. You may recall a story on this podcast about one of the final Windows updates for Windows 7 and Server 2008 R2 that had an adverse effect and caused issues with wallpapers. You may also recall last week that I covered a story on an out-of-band patch being released for this. Well, I'm afraid I've got some more bad news. Some users of 2008 R2 have reported issues booting after installing the out-of-band patch. As it turns out, this is caused by not having fully deployed the latest SHA-2 enablement packages. The enablement package was supplied and enabled through Windows updates in March and again in September of last year. BleepingComputer.com provides some manual fixes in their article, but the best thing to do with this to be sure is to ensure that you've got the last servicing stack installed and also install the updates that enables the more secure signing. 
Dell have disclosed a security bug with their support assist tool. What is the support assist tool you ask? According to bleepingcomputer.com, it proactively checks the health of your system's hardware and software. When an issue is detected, the necessary system state information is sent to Dell for troubleshooting to begin. The bug in question allows a locally authenticated regular user account to run a privileged execution of arbitrary code. If you have auto updates enabled, it will update with the fix itself. Otherwise, you'll have to manually go out there and check for updates to get it. I've been doing this podcast for over two years now, and this is one of a handful of stories of this type of vendor bloatware that ships with home-grade PCs having a serious vulnerability. It's just one more incentive to wipe the slate clean when you buy a new laptop. A domain name investor named Mike O'Connor, who purchased several choice domain names in 1994, including Grill.com, Television.com, and several others, has put one of his most controversial domain names up for sale, Corp.com. As Krebs on Security.com reports, it is sensitive because years of testing shows whoever wields it would have access to an unending stream of passwords, email, and other proprietary data belonging to hundreds of thousands of systems and major companies around the globe. O'Connor is selling the domain for $1.7 million and has said he hopes Microsoft will buy it. One reason for O'Connor hoping Microsoft will buy it is that by virtue of the unique way Windows handles resolving domain names on a local network, virtually all of the computers trying to share sensitive data with corp.com are somewhat confused Windows PCs. More importantly, early versions of Windows actually encouraged the adoption of insecure settings that made it more likely Windows computers might try to share sensitive data with corp.com. In short, this means that Whoever controls corp.com can passively intercept private communications from hundreds of thousands of computers that end up being taken outside of a corporate environment which uses this corp designation for its Active Directory domain. It'll be interesting to see who buys this. Hopefully it is Microsoft. On server 2019, have you noticed published applications appearing without a border or a frame around the apps? Maybe just an undefined white around them? If so, Gerrit Dukbud has shared a fix over on his site, which is dybbugt.no. So if that sounds like a problem you've encountered, check it out. And I'll share a link to his blog with this episode, which is episode 111. You'll find it on 5bytespodcast.com under reference links. In a little cross-platform support news, the VMware Workspace ONE app will be made available via the Okta integration network. This integration uses Skim to enable account provisioning and updates from Okta to Workspace ONE. With this integration, as users join your organization, identity provisioning can flow from your Okta Universal Directory, HR Master, or other directory into Workspace ONE. This enables users to access all of the applications they've been provisioned from any device through the Workspace ONE Intelligent Hub. It's interesting to see where Okta is now in relation to the likes of Citrix Workspace and Workspace ONE because they've covered such a wide area for what they could do and it is a really great superior authentication and identity solution that it plays quite nicely into both offerings. And to focus a little bit on remote work for a second, a couple of weeks ago I covered a story about two of the largest tech companies in China requiring their employees to work from home due to concerns from the coronavirus. Just recently in my home country of Ireland, Indeed.com required all of its Irish employees to work remote as a precaution due to the coronavirus with the belief that an employee who may have come in contact with the illness may have had interactions with those in their Sydney and Dublin offices. And in further interesting remote work type of news, GZ.com reported this week that there was a telework day in Japan last July. As preparation for the future Olympics to be held in the country, the government requested companies to experiment with remote working, declaring that July 24th be a telework day for the next three years. 
The prime minister there has said he would like to increase the number of employees who work at least one day a week from home to 10% by 2020, so this year. This embrace of remote working should hopefully reduce congestion to help them better support the Olympics. Interestingly, Paul Stansel shared the fact that cloud.com is now blocked in China and has been for about three weeks or so, which means Citrix Cloud is in effect blocked. So a bit counterintuitive to their current predicament. And finally, on the topic of remote working, I noticed ThinScale posted a preview of an upcoming feature of their ThinScale Thin Kiosk version 6 offering with a feature called the Secure Remote Workers Write Filter. It helps to protect your system by redirecting any writes to the drive within the Secure Remote Worker to a virtual overlay within a temporary location. The overlay is destroyed upon ending the Secure Remote Worker session and it allows admins to maintain a unified and clean experience for their users' work environments. So it kind of sounds like it's a type of secure sandbox that's disposable and gets teared away after each session. So that sounds pretty interesting. I'd like to give a congrats to all of the new and renewed Citrix CTPs and CTAs. The list of newbies is pretty amazing. There are some very sharp people added to both groups this year. And on a personal note, this year I opted to resign from the Citrix CTP group, and I'm now in the CTA group again. I did this because there are some amazing benefits to being a CTP, including the opportunity to attend CTP meetups and Citrix Synergy. Unfortunately, last year I wasn't able to go due to work commitments, and knew, again, that I wouldn't be able to go this year. I also felt... I wasn't as engaged in the group as I should have been for such an exclusive program. Others in the group were much more active than I was. I figured I was taking a spot from someone who could avail of a pass to Citrix Synergy and actually attend and would be more involved in the group than I could be, or at least more than I have been for the last two or three months. I wish my CTP friends all the best and say to the CTAs, I look forward to working with you and getting to know you. And speaking of CTPs and synergy and just general community stuff, a reminder that the EUC Masters Retreat is going to be held this April in Scottsdale, Arizona. And a bonus announcement, there will be a one-day EUC Masters Retreat meetup and event before Citrix Synergy this year. So if you're going to Synergy, be sure to register for the EUC Masters event on Sunday the 17th of May in Orlando. And now, for this episode, I've got a hot job. This role comes courtesy of Citrix, who are looking for a lead technical account manager in their London office. As the lead technical account manager, Tam, you focus on being a trusted business advisor to the customer success services, priority support customers, primarily building and maintaining relationships between support and the assigned customers. You have high visibility and interact with many groups internally and externally to help achieve a world-class level of customer service and satisfaction. As the lead TAM, you own significant projects as well as functioning as the technology lead for others on the team. You create and provide content, mentoring, and leadership through more difficult scenarios across the field support service team. Some of the highlights of the role, you ensure an excellent support experience with customers to increase the value of their investment in Citrix technologies to help drive increased adoption. A primary responsibility of the lead TAM is to manage the coordinated delivery of support for Citrix priority accounts. You act as the customer's trusted advisor and single point of contact within Citrix, leveraging peers in support, engineering, consulting, and education to address customer issues, and more. Some of what they're looking for is good knowledge and experience in computing and networking technologies with appropriate certificates and qualifications. Typically requires a university degree or equivalent experience and minimum five years of prior relevant experience or a master's degree with three years, or a PhD without the experience. Kind of interesting, they throw a PhD in there with no experience. Oh, I wonder how that works out. Um, 
A candidate also requires advanced knowledge of job area, typically obtained through advanced education combined with experience. May have practical knowledge of project management. I think a lot of us who are Citrix customers have dealt with TAMs, and you probably know, or at least it's my perception, having worked with our TAM quite a lot, it's a pretty demanding role. So I'd say if you breathe and live Citrix, this could be just a role for you. And if you're that really passionate type of person for driving customer success, this could be a great opportunity. And now this episode, scripts, tricks, and tips. Helga Klein shared a really handy little tool to simulate keyboard input delay, pointing out that less than 50 milliseconds, he pointed out that less than 50 milliseconds feels pretty good when typing, but 200 milliseconds plus is really awful. This could be really interesting for those of you working on VDI and DAS projects for discovering what your threshold might be. Helga also shared his own blog in which he details using the Firefox containers feature to run multiple different Gmail mailboxes side by side. This is something I've seen done with CloudHouse in the past and can be very handy for other products too like Office 365. You might have multiple mailboxes and maybe even multiple Skype for Businesses instances that you want to run side by side. Finally, I've talked a little about the LDAPs change coming up in Windows. Getting a handle on what currently uses LDAP in your environment and is under threat of getting broken by the change is a daunting task for many. Good news, if you use ExtraHop, they actually have a dashboard that can show you what is using LDAP communication in your environment and hopefully tell you what will be affected and where you need to proactively take action. Well, that's it for another episode. If you like the podcast, I'd really appreciate it if you could go to your podcast platform of choice and give it a rating. If you don't like the podcast, I'd appreciate some feedback. I'm always trying to learn and do this better. That's it for another week. Thank you all so much for listening.